Nothing that exists in this world came into being by chance. All was thoughtfully created with a purpose by a designer. As artists, we are privileged to participate in this creative process. The purposeful creator exists to promote and elevate the arts and those that contribute so much to promoting and beautifying this world. I'm your host, John Potoshnik, and I look forward to you joining me on this journey of discovery and learning. Hi folks, thanks for joining me for this. I'm calling it a vlog. It's a combination of a, vi a video, a blog, and a podcast. And I have an exciting guest for you this time. Uh, my guest is Tim Bro. I became acquainted with him, oh, probably 11 years or so ago when I received an email from him asking if I'd be interested in mentoring him. And up to that time, I hadn't even considered uh, personal mentoring. But there was something about him that, and his sincere request that got my attention, and that ultimately began a three-year mentoring relationship, in which I'd give him assignments, and then when he completed them, we would discuss them over the telephone. The thing about Tim is that he was just an excellent student. He was dedicated to learning, and not only just learning, but applying the lessons that I taught him. And as a result, he's become an award-winning artist and his work has become uniquely his own. I'm pleased to bring you this special interview. Tim's not only an artist, but he's also an author and an inventor and a pharmacist of all things. He's uniquely qualified to share with you how he's developed his career and what he believes is necessary to do so. So thanks for joining me for this insightful interview with my friend, Tim Bro. Hey there, Tim. Nice to see you. I um, I really appreciate you doing this interview with me, and and I'm I'm looking forward to uh, you know sharing your work with our audience, and also I think they're really going to appreciate what you have uh, have to share with us. So why don't we begin by just uh, telling us where you live? Hey, John. Thanks for having me today. I live in Ozark, Missouri. I moved here in 1995. Grew up in Louisiana, and um, I've been here for I guess 27 years. Yeah, I think we I think we've known each other since uh, 2011. So we've known each other a while. And yeah. you know, one of the things that uh, it fascinates me about you, you're a pretty talented guy. You're not only a painter, but you're also an author and an inventor and a pharmacist. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, I've been a pharmacist for 36 years. I uh, graduated from pharmacy school in 1986 and practiced pharmacy in Louisiana for eight years and moved here. And I've been uh, working at the hospital as clinical pharmacist for 27 years here. Uh, one of the things that I was very fortunate to have happen early on when I moved here was I was able to work a three-day work week. So I worked three long shifts mm -hmm. on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and that freed me up to be able to pursue art. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I was wondering yeah. how, you're, how you're doing that, how you, uh, how you work your time to pursue art. So what are you, mm, yeah. part-time now then? Well, I just went part time. Yeah, this oh. this week. So I'll be, you know, before I pursued pharmacy full time and art full time, which meant 70 hours a week. And now it'll be, you know, art, uh, pharmacy part time and art full time plus. What do you call full time, like a 40 hour week? Well, at the hospital, I normally work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which oh. which is great for painting because you're in the studio and you've got days, you know, I work around the garden and mowing and all of those other duties that I have but I usually had Monday through Thursday to paint and then I work long hours at the hospital so I pretty much work 40 hours in the art business you know there's so much more than painting to the business you gotta you know 
put your work out there, promote, ship, and all of that too. But I probably spend about 40 hours a week one way or another wow. thinking or, or planning on a painting. Yeah, that's impressive. Are you going to continue as a pharmacist then for a few more years? I think so, you know, uh, two or three years probably, and yeah. I'll stay part-time is the plan right now. It's kind of up in the air, actually. We worked together, at the, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think we started together in uh, 20, uh, we knew each other in 2011. Mm. Mm -hmm. I worked with you for a few years, but one of the things that most impressed me about you is you're you're just an excellent you were an excellent student, and I think that's really shown throughout your career here over these years. And I well, think the you. thing that made you an excellent student is that you not only took the instruction to heart, but you applied it. You know, there's a lot about you know just listening to someone speak, but application is the key thing. I think that's what really made you stand out and has helped your growth. Are there some other things that uh, helped you to grow significantly as rapidly as you have? Well, I, I think early on, I didn't start painting until I was 40. I think we've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. I had uh, painted some murals on my daughter's wall. And uh, then one February, I set up some apples on a plate and took the hobby paints and painted a still life of the apples. And uh, I painted a couple more paintings after that. I don't know. When you start painting at 40, there's a sense of urgency, I think. Yeah. That uh, And it was a problem. I, I did a lot of other things before I painted. I had driving horses and built some wagons. I was a woodworker. I built some Native American uh, replica bows and arrows. So I chased a lot of other things. And uh, But when I started painting, all those other things just started getting in the way of that. And I knew then, I said, it's, this is a, a problem I need to solve and not that I need to crack. Yeah. So, um, so I think that helped that sense of urgency was there. And also I, I didn't see any of this coming. I mean, I didn't paint or draw in grade school. I didn't have any classes in college and, uh, I really, you know, this is, this wasn't on my radar. So, uh, when I got into it, I didn't have a, you know, Oh, a, a lot of beginning artists or people that want to paint, they have this fear of failure and, I really, I really didn't have that fear. I, it was a nut I wanted to crack and I didn't expect to succeed, but I was going to do it anyway. Yeah. So and, uh, then your attitude and commitment seems to be super important. Yeah. I've always been driven when I, when I have other pursuits, um, you know, I, I always work hard at them and, and I think that has helped me over the years. Where do you think this a sudden love of art and deciding to do this as a, you know, hopefully a career, how did that come about? I mean, that just, you said it, it seems to have just come out of the blue. How in the world does that Well, happen? you know, yes, it came out of the blue and no. Um, I, I didn't take any classes and I started when I was 40 and, and, uh, but there was something different about me before that. When I was in my twenties, we lived in, Shreveport, Louisiana. I just got out of pharmacy school and there's a gallery there called Norton Art Gallery and it's got a great Hudson River collection. Mm -hmm. And I would go in there and uh, and just walk and stare at those Hudson River paintings. And, you know, I was a guy that had the painting three inches from my nose looking at every brushstroke. This is before I started painting, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so I could stand in front of one painting for 30 minutes or an hour. So I, even in my 20s, I appreciated art. Yeah, but I, I still, it never crossed my mind. Oh, maybe you want to do this. You know? yeah. And I think maybe, maybe once I started painting, all those things came back that, that I saw in those paintings. So I was a student before, even though I didn't actually apply myself. You know, we have, uh, I'm sure quite a few people in our audience that are kind of probably where you, where you are, you know, they're uh, midlife or so, and they want to pursue art. What recommendation would you have for them? Mm. Well, um, uh, don't chase a lot of fads. Find one good teacher and learn everything yeah. you can from them. I love that. You know, or a couple of teachers. Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, when you and I started working together, um, uh, I really didn't know what to expect. But one of the things that you did, you didn't only teach me what to do or, or how to have a technique to, to accomplish something. You taught me the fundamentals. Uh -huh. And uh, more importantly, you, told, you didn't teach me only what to chase, but what not to chase. You know, there was a lot of fluff and a lot of things that you can pursue out there that just won't help you. 
And I uh, think you stepped in and, and got me on the right track. So what I would tell people that are thinking about it, maybe that are fearful of whether or not they, they will succeed, um, expect to paint a lot of bad paintings before you paint good paintings mm -hmm. and embrace the fail. I mean, just, just take a failure as, as learning experience and move yeah. on. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you can't decide if you want to paint or not, you know, and, and you're debating, well, just, just commit yourself to it for about 400 paintings and then reevaluate. Yeah, no, I think that's good, Tim. One of the things yeah. too, I recommend is, uh, when you're starting off work smaller, just because you can encounter a lot more problems and and uh, you don't have to worry about creating a painting to hang over the sofa, so to speak. But then you can uh, learn a lot faster, I think, by doing the smaller works. Paint small and paint often. And yeah. I think I got that from you because, you know, if you paint a big painting, there's um, concept and design and drawing goes into that. But then you have to fill in all that space. And uh, if you paint small early on, then... Uh, you get to go through that repetition of the whole process of creating a painting more than uh, some big painting that you've got to finish and, and yeah. you lose the excitement for it. Yeah, I think what you said earlier about, um, you know, you were fearless kind of from the beginning. I think working smaller, too, will help that because now you, you haven't committed to a large painting that you know has to really be good and mean something. You can yeah. look at all these little paintings as learning experiences and studies. and. Yeah, I think that's pretty. I, I think it was Richard Schmidt that uh, that said, "Don't think about all all of the uh, of whether or not you've got it in you to be a great artist, because you won't know beforehand. You have to go through the process before yeah. before you know. So just paint and enjoy the process, and just see where it takes you." with your science background, does that affect the way you approach a painting? So the scientists always ask why. I remember when I showed up, I, I went to my first plenary event with a guy named Dave Bennett. Uh, he was a pastor that I knew, and he took me under his arm as my first mentor in plein air painting. And he took me to uh, Augusta, Missouri, and I showed up with my easel and my pencil and my ruler. And, you know, I, I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, so that science didn't help me there, but, um, uh, I think that, that it has its advantages, uh, like in studying value, uh, after we talked for a long time, I, I just realized that, okay, there's something going on here that I'm not getting. And I started really researching. I went back kind of to the beginning of the study of light and, uh, color perception and brightness and, and that science helped me there. I think. Yeah. Now, I think you did an article. Didn't you do an article uh, some time ago on value and, and color and all that? And it was yeah, almost I, a scientific approach to it, I think. It, it was. Uh, it, it was uh, a series of six articles that I wrote for International Artist Magazine. Right. And it, it explored light and color uh, and perception and how we see things. And then um, that kind of, I condensed that into a book that you can download for free on my website. Um, but, uh, that gives you some tools. It first explains what happens, uh, how we perceive what we're, uh, what we're viewing. And then there are some defects in that percep perception that can really affect our work as an artist. And I give some tools on how to correct that, how to, how to plan for that in the paint. What's so, oh, okay. yeah. Hey, when you're, uh, uh, doing a painting, you know, what, what do you hope to communicate through your work and how do you select your subject? Mm. Um, so the, uh, uh, someone that downloaded that or would download that, what will they mainly get out of that? Do you think? Well, I think that, that they will learn, uh, how we perceive color and light. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's not as simple as there is a image in front of us and it just transmits to the brain. There's a chemical process that mixed in there. And, um, and I think that for artists, a lot of times we will struggle to maintain values within a value mass, especially across different fields of illumination. And uh, this will point out and give some examples of how there are defects in that mm -hmm. and then some, some ways to overcome it.
when you're uh, painting plein air, what uh, what are the big takeaways? I mean, what's the value of doing that? There's just no substitute for for actually looking at what's happening in nature as the light goes through the landscape. And uh, you know, when we look at uh, when we looked at, at the sky reflecting down into some tree branches, uh, it's not just sky color that's that's reflecting into that. It's also the leaves around that branch. Uh, it's the trunk above that branch. It, it can be a number of things uh, that affect that. So you don't pick that up in a in a photograph. So uh, I think that that painting from nature helps you see those things that you just can't see from a photograph. Mm -hmm. And um, then it's a lot of fun too. It, you know, it yeah. can be a lot of work. I wanted to. Uh proceed we were talking about how your work has progressed over the years tell us about that what has come into play to create that the scientific background was a huge help on figuring out how how to perceive or how to translate light patterns and dark patterns onto the canvas but it also came with uh, this kind of innate need to be very precise which meant i had a lot of hard edges in my work mm -hmm. and i still do so it's a struggle uh, but uh, I've learned that you can be accurate, I think is the word, but not be precise. So uh, you can use edges uh, in places that uh, that you need at hard edges, and then you can uh, back off on that when you get away from the focal point. So that that's something that's changed. Also, painting with, uh, I travel and paint with Gil Adams from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's a great artist, and he is very expressive. Working with him has is, is really helped me get looser. And uh, just just the nature of, of painting with him so much. He also encouraged me to paint with a palette knife, and that's something for the past couple of months I've been painting large and painting with a uh, with a palette knife. And there's a, an immediacy to that, and also the uh, the need to mix color for almost every palette knife stroke. You have to mix another puddle of, of color if you're using a four inch palette knife, you know. And uh, when I first started. Uh, and you know that scene in Jaws where uh, where he looks back at the camera when the big shark shows up and he says, we're going to need a bigger boat? <laughs> well, <laughs> about two hours into this palette, that first palette knife painting, oh. I thought, I'm going to need a bigger tube of paint. Are you um, are you working palette knife on site? No, no. Okay. When I'm plein air painting, no. In yeah, the that, studio. In, in the studio. Okay. But I'm, I'm uh, actually, the, the what got me started... Uh, I, I do use a palette knife sometimes. And I was painting in, uh, I think it was a Eureka Springs Invitational in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And Gil had, and I had been painting for three days and I had a few paintings that, that were just okay. And we had to turn in our paintings by noon, I think. And it was eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. And we were just sit, sitting around. I said, well, you know what? I, I need to clean my palette. So I'm going to, you know, paint a little nine by 12 of a tree right here in the parking lot of the motel. Yeah. And I used a palette knife to clean my palette. And I did a painting with the palette knife. And that's the painting that won an award. That's how it goes. Yeah. It just, that's how it goes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You are a fast painter. Why do you think that is? It's is it the tools or the way you think, or why are you able to create a painting pretty rapidly? I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I can tell you that that I'll go plein air painting and and I'll be done, and, and some of the other people are are still setting up or halfway through their <laughs> painting, and, and that's for better or worse. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, you know. And and my plein air pieces are fairly unrefined sometimes they're not finished well and and that might be my next evolution that i try to actually uh you know refine a painting a plein air painting but uh, when i'm out plein air painting it's really the immediacy i'm capturing what i see and like i said 
if I, I know if I take that back to the studio, it, it's going to be the experience that, yeah. that I've learned from more so than that painting, what, that, what I did on the canvas. So that's part of it, I think. Uh, yeah. In the studio, some, sometimes I'll spend, you know, I'll spend three weeks on a single painting in yeah. the studio. You know, that's unusual for me. You fear, uh, yeah. feel you're as fearless outside painting as you are in the studio? or Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, I fail. I fail outdoors quite a bit. Yeah. Um, when I show up to a plein air event, I can usually count on the first painting being a wipeout. And then the second two paintings are a dog. And then I start improving from then, especially if I haven't painted. I, I don't paint the plein air circuit. I just do, you know, three events a year or something mm -hmm. like that, just around around where I live. It doesn't sound like you're yeah. afraid to wipe a painting out if you need to. No, no. If, if that's a seven dollar panel, buddy, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I get my seven dollars back. <laughs> and, and you know, I don't want I don't want the memory. You know, I, yeah. and that's some that's another thing that that I might mention uh, that that's different with me. Some people they'll paint a painting and they have a emotional connection to that painting when they're done. And, and I just don't, not yeah. very much, you know, I, my, my experience is in the moment when I'm painting that painting and when I'm done, I'm done. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I say goodbye, uh, failure. And, and now I've got a tone canvas for the next one. Yeah, exactly. Hey, before we go, Tim, tell us about that. Uh, some of your inventions here. Lately, I've uh, over the past three years, I have been working on a few inventions. I got the idea that I wanted to build a easel uh, that was built around a sealable uh, pallet. So, oh. uh, I don't know if you're most people are familiar with the master, the blue Masterson pallet. Yes. Uh -huh. Well. Um, what I found, I would go to these plenary events, and people would set up their easel. I had a Soltec easel, and uh, I've got friends that they have the French easels, and we would open up our French easel or our Soltec or whatever, and then we take our blue sealable palette and put on top, open it up so that so that when we're done, we can just put the lid on it and use yeah. it later. And uh, I got this idea that what if I built an easel around that sealable pallet? So that's what I did. And, oh. and I'll show it to you. Yeah. Um, I don't I know if you can, you can see it. Oh, that's this how, is it. Oh. Yeah, is that, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. I see that. Oh, that's yeah. pretty neat. How's yeah. it attached? Okay. It just sets on it. Very it neat. It just sets it. Yeah. 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 And, uh, it, and another great thing about this, let's say that you're out there um, uh, painting and it's an overcast day and it's, you think, oh, well, it's going to rain. Well, once it starts, if it starts sprinkling, you can just undo this one knob right here and just take the whole thing off the, the easel and set it in the car. And then as soon as the rain stops, or you can even, uh, it makes a great rainy day easel too. You can sit in the in the car while it's raining and paint yeah. if you need to finish it. Yeah. Very good. So, What's the and, other one there? Um, I've got a, a, a wet panel carrier. During my easel project, I uh, got this idea that, hey, what if I make some... Uh, wet panel carriers that are mailable. So this is the single version. So the idea with this is that let's say that you're uh, you're traveling across the country, uh, you're going to Colorado or, or uh, California, and you're going to paint uh, on your way there. Well, this is a really great lightweight way. It's a six by eight uh, wet panel carrier. Mm -hmm. So you paint your painting, and let's say that um, you can use it as a promotional tool on. Uh, social media you can say hey i'm driving across country this is a, uh, a painting that i did today and it's available for this much money and uh, you can put it uh, in the box and yeah. then you close you close the clamshell and uh, then it holds the painting in there where it won't get damaged and then it's got a mailer on the back so you can mail this to a collector and then i have a three panel version that has trays that goes down on on each each painting. So you okay. put your painting in here. This is the third one. And then you can put this tray down on top of it. On top of that, yeah. Yeah. And like this one, I've mailed back to myself. So let's say that you're uh, you're traveling and you only have so much room in your luggage. You can paint three little studies, put it in this box, and then mail it home. Very cool. Yeah. 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 And it's a travel light wet panel carrier. You can just contact me directly if you want it. I have them packaged with uh, with different types of panels, uh, source tech panels and polyflax, cotton, two types of linen.
Yeah, I use that Polyflex too. That's a pretty nice canvas. Hey, Tim, thanks for this. I appreciate it very much. And um, I'm sure our audience is going to really appreciate this and learn from you. So you uh, you mean a lot to me. And uh, the, the way you've applied yourself as a student, I think is a, a really good example for others. And I hope they'll follow it because they'll benefit. You know, one of the, one of the best gifts that that someone that's wanting to paint uh, can have is for a real professional to take some time out of their their life to teach another generation uh, how to paint. Mm -hmm. And you did that for me, and uh, it's the single best uh, best thing that happened in my career was you taught me how to paint, and I I thank you for that. And uh, yeah. you know, for all of the professional artists out there, you know, that, let that be a lesson to us to to yeah. give back to to others that you know and we need to bring doing, that next generation along. You're doing the same, aren't you? Yeah, I've got some students. That's how you do it. Yeah, pass it on. It's nothing that uh, you know we have learned on our own. We we've learned it from others. We don't really own it. We yeah. just we just share it with others. So, thanks so much, Tim, and um, we'll talk again. Look forward to okay. uh, seeing you sometime. Thank you, John. All right, take care, buddy. All right, bye. Bye.